All right, Romaine, thank you so much. And this is a great backdrop for our guest here, uh, right here on Bloomberg Business Week on radio, on TV, on YouTube, and Quick Take. We are welcoming the chairman and CEO of General Motors. We're talking about Mary Barr, who is a Stanford Graduate School of Business alum, class of 1990. Mary, first of all, so good to have you here. We want to talk about your time here at Stanford. It's raining. I think you probably had a lot more sun <laughs> when you were here, but um, so grateful to have you here. We have to ask you, though, first about the economic outlook. When you look at uh, what's to come, do you think about recession? How does it feel to you? Well, you know, I'm not an economist, so I can't really call a recession, but I can tell you what I'm seeing in the business right now. And at General Motors, I think on the strength of our products, we're still seeing uh, very strong demand uh, and pricing. It's moderated a little, but uh, still well well ahead of levels uh, you know, that were pre pre-COVID and pre the semiconductor shortage. So it's something we're continuing to watch on a, a daily um, a daily basis. But uh, for the auto industry, you know, we're seeing a little bit from a used car pricing, but, but still very strong demand. How does that change your outlook at all for 2023 and what you're expecting next year? Give us an idea of indicators that you're watching. Sure. Well, one of the things is we are planning for, um, you know, we, we decided to, to put our plan around uh, a more conservative market uh, around 15 uh, million SAR, which is the seasonal adjusted sales rate. And because uh, we understand that, you know, if we set everything up, if there's bit more opportunity, we'll be able to seize the opportunity. But we're taking the approach that we're going to be very mindful of cost as we go into next year. We have a strong product portfolio uh, with uh, new uh, new mid-sized trucks coming off of you know new trucks that we've just launched this year. So we're confident in our product portfolio, but we're going to be conservative with costs. You know, Mary, you also you guys just gave us an update just a short time ago, and you talked about uh, your EV pro you know uh, expectations. Um, one thing we wanted to ask you: some of the things that General Motors has talked about, those EV incentives, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, it has said that you guys will do EVs will reach parity with conventional cars, will help profits reach parity uh, between EVs and conventional cars. Does that mean that General Motors thinks it will sell one million EVs in 2025 without those incentives? I wonder if you could give us some clarification and color on that. Well, you know, we made that statement and that um, set that goal for ourselves uh, that we'll have the capacity to be able to sell a million units in North America and frankly in China by 2025. And we think with the strong product portfolio we're going to have at different price points, you know, from from the Cadillac Lyric to the uh, the Hummer, the uh, Chevy Silverado, the GMC Sierra, down to a, a Chevy Equinox and a Chevy Blazer, we're going to have the products uh, across the market that are going to allow us to, to achieve that metric. So we think we've got the right plan. Uh, this was all in place before the incentive uh, package came as a part of IRA. But we're, you know, we think that will help. And it's doing what it was supposed to, we think it was intended to do, was to drive EV adoption. And, you know, we've invested a lot in the United States creating jobs, which I think is going to create a stronger economy. So I think it's going to accomplish the objectives. And it, you know, happened to uh, be very aligned with the plan we were already executing. Do those incentives, though, help margins? Like, it's not a bad thing to have, right? Well, no, I mean, because if you think about it, um, you know, from an electric vehicle perspective, the battery is the most expensive piece and where everyone is working to improve battery technology. I think General Motors is in a leading um, position uh, or among the leaders from a battery cost perspective. Our plant in Ohio is now producing cells. So that's a that's a big advantage. And we have another plant coming on next year and the year after. So I think that's going to be important. But to really get um, uh, all companies and consumers uh, to move forward to EVs, I think this is, is very important. So yes, we, we think that it will be helpful uh, and allow us to continue to invest in the United States. I do want to talk a little bit more about that battery plant in Ohio, the Ultim Ultium battery plant in Lordstown, Ohio. Next week is set to vote on whether or not to join the union, workers there, that is. This is a big deal. It's the first battery plant to have a vote in North America. Do you think the EV business will include the union? And it, is it good for America to have a union involved in this? Well, you know, we're very supportive of, of the plant being unionized. Uh, you know, we have a very productive relationship with our labor partners around the globe. We work together on safety, which I think is fundamental on quality. 
And uh, so, you know, obviously the, the employees are, are going to be voting, but we're very supportive. Mary, one thing, and it looks like maybe this issue is, is being dealt with, because, you know, it's funny, we talked with John Levin, the dean of Stanford, um, Graduate School of Business, about just how they get students ready for just so many different things that's going to potentially come at them as leaders. And I was just thinking about the rail strike, like leading up to this inf interview with you. It looks like from Chuck Schumer that maybe we can put this to rest. But have you guys been strategizing around that and that the impact it could have on GM if indeed it went down? Oh, absolutely. We've been, uh, you know, even um, uh, several weeks ago when the, the first deadline came up, we're, we're watching it very closely. We're encouraging the parties to find an agreement. It will have an impact. There's, you know, when you look at how parts and, and product are moved uh, across the country, it will have a, uh, it will have a significant impact. But uh, we've done the planning that we can and we understand and also are having the right communication with the rail companies. All right, we, do, we appreciate you weighing in on that. Hey, one thing we wanted to ask you too, man, I, like the news for General Motors <laughs> just comes fast and furious. There was a report yesterday, Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, about these ride-sharing robo-taxis with no steering wheels. I don't know, what can you tell us about this? And this is coming through the GM Cruise Division. What can you tell us about this? Is this something that you guys are, are, are working on and really pushing ahead on? Absolutely. We will we'll be ready to launch the Origin next year, and it is a vehicle that's purpose-built um, for rideshare. Cruise has uh, the technology. We're the only company that is operating and actually charging for rides in San Francisco. By the end of the year, we'll have uh, vehicles uh, operating uh, in Phoenix as well as Austin. And so we think a lot of people think this technology is five or ten years away. It's here now and um, couldn't be more proud of the Cruise team. And I think uh, when you, we have the origin and people are going to see that that really takes uh, rideshare up a notch with the comfort, the convenience uh, that you have with uh, autonomous vehicle rideshare. So could, couldn't be more supportive and I'm very excited about this technology. Okay, so robo taxis coming soon. Maybe we'll take yes. a ride in them next time we're here at Stanford. Hey, Mary, you're on the board of Walt Disney, so I, I got to ask about the recent shakeup there. Um, when did the discussion start to make a change and bring back Bob Iger? Well, you know, I, I'm really not here to talk about Disney, um, and I'm not going to talk about the specific timing that's you know confidential from a board perspective. But what I will say is we are incredibly confident. I personally am confident in Bob's ability to set the strategic direction for renewed growth, just as he has done in the past. Uh, you know, this is a period of enormous change and Bob understands that. And he's really uniquely suited to navigate the challenges facing Disney and the broader industry. And he'll focus and take the right steps as it relates to uh, efficiencies and a cost-effective structure. But I think, you know, the initial message that he has is so important that creativity is the heart and soul of the company. So. Uh, the board will work, work closely with him um, to identify and, and have the right succession process uh, in this two years. But um, I think right now, if you look at what he accomplished in 15 years, he's the right leader. His legacy on storytelling and what he accomplished with the company is, is really uh, undeniable. So I think he's the right person for the job. Mary, you know, we said a lot of things coming at you fast and furiously. I think about Twitter and GM and advertising. You know, what are your expectations about Twitter going forward? Is it just kind of a wait and see approach to see whether or not you want to have advertising back on the platform? How do you feel about that? Yeah, we just want to better understand, you know, and make sure that uh, there's the right um, uh, monitoring of content. Uh, you know, our brands are very important. And so, we are, we are continuing to, to work with the Twitter team and understand where they're going, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. I have to say, one of the things in prepping for this is you gave a speech, I think it was back in 2016, to graduates. And you talked about how when getting an MBA, everybody thought about Gordon Gecko of the Wall Street movie. I think it has definitely evolved when you think about all the different people who get MBAs and where they go. What is, though, the smart conversation about women specifically in senior roles? You did it. Um, but it's interesting, even though there's parity among men and women maybe at business schools, it's not necessarily in the C-suite. And I just, I'm curious what your thoughts are. What's the smart conversation about, about getting more women in senior roles? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, for me personally, my time at Stanford was transformational. I always say in some cases, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it, you know, taught me so much about business being the fact that I had a uh, engineering degree and that's what I, uh, the degree I pursued before I went there. So I think, you know, continuing to, to attract women into business school is very, very important. But then, you know, like Stanford, they have specific, um, you know, uh, initiatives to work to make sure women are prepared uh, for getting to the C-suite and, and have a network and support to do that. So I think we've just got to keep working it. I think a lot of it rests on companies to have the right pipeline. It's not, you know, it's not something you do at the last minute. It's, it, it's what you do, you know, the minute someone joins the company and having a strong pipeline through each of the different areas of the company. And that's what we try to do at General Motors. But I think the learning um, that an MBA provides definitely allows, um, you know, both, both, you know, everyone who attends the opportunity to be better pre uh, prepared to succeed. Mary, 20 seconds, one trait that you got from being at Stanford that you take with you today? Oh my gosh, there are so many things um, that I learned at Stanford. Um, but I, I, I think one of the key things is, it's and, and what is I think so special about the Stanford Graduate School of Business is their focus on leadership. Because leadership, no matter what challenge you face, engaging people, being able to set the strategic direction, it all centers on having strong leadership. And that's a focus and I think uh, a big distinguisher of what uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business has accomplished. Well, many would argue that you have done that at General Motors in terms of putting it on a sustainable uh, path and sustainability path, if you will, in terms of the product. Mary Barr, thank you so much. We so appreciate it. The chairman and CEO of General Motors joining us on Bloomberg Business Week on radio, TV, YouTube, and Quick Tech. Mary, be well. Thank you. Stanford class, Graduate School of Business, 1990. Thank you, Mary.